Well, welcome to the follow-up podcast. My name is Hayden. I am the worship director here at Arbor Church. And today I'm joined by Allison Oconee, our community care pastor, and Cliff Tatama, our interim pastor and speaker from Sunday. This is uh, our second take. We started and uh, Allison's microphone died. So flatlined. <laughs> yes. I had a flat line for her recording, so we had to start over. Um, but how I started a few minutes ago was I said, if uh, you weren't here on Sunday, it was a second part of our changes series. We also did child dedications and we celebrated mothers because it was Mother's Day. And um, I had mentioned Hannah is someone that we don't typically hear a lot about in the Bible, but Cliff, you decided to speak on her story. And my question to you that I will ask again, what was the inspiration behind talking about Hannah? I had this incredible vision. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> Somebody's very... No, I thought, let's, let's not try. giving the it same answer. It didn't, it, that didn't was... go, it didn't go over so good the first time when I just said the Holy Spirit. Yeah. So I thought I'd try something different. Yeah, but, let's yeah. see it. Yeah. You know, I, I think, and I'd love to claim credit. Alice and I were talking just before we came online about how often the Holy Spirit can make us look good. Mm -hmm. And really, I would say, suggest that's exactly what happened mm. because doing the dedications uh, on Sunday, and it didn't even dawn on me when I'd picked Hannah about her dedicating Samuel like she did, yep. uh, Hannah being the one that uh, wasn't able to have a child for years and was mm -hmm. praying for that, and that that's a time, Mother's Day is a time when uh, ladies who are in that place, if, mm -hmm. if there's ever a painful day of the year for them, yep. it, it'd be Mother's Day. Mm -hmm. And so to be able to address that and how God interacted with that, I think was... Uh, I just got to give him all the credit. I'd, yeah. like to, I'd like to say it was brilliant on my part, but really it wasn't. <laughs> <laughs> I'm curious because um, when I got your email for notes and slides, um, the first slide that I saw was an old man, and I'm curious. <laughs> were you trying to throw people off the scent of what you're talking about? Because I'm like, it's Mother's Day. We're talking about Hannah, and the first thing that we open with is this old man. Who's the what? old man? The uh, priest? Uh, no, the old man who uh, at the, the beginning story, the the of the four college boys who shared the room together, and the old man comes to the door, oh, gotcha. uh, and he's looks like a bum. I mean, he's bedraggled. He's uh, you know, and so mm -hmm. I found a picture online of an old man that yeah. looked like I thought was picturing that guy to look like, and gotcha. that's what was on the screen. So Hayden said, felt like I for Mother's Day was really throwing him off <laughs> track to begin with, but yeah. it was all about what a giver he was yeah. out of his poverty, mm -hmm. giving back to God that way, and which is really where we're going to go with Hannah's willingness mm -hmm. to give back to God what God had first given to her. Yeah. So. And out of her poverty, because yes. she had wanted a child for so long and wasn't unable to have one. Right. Um. So that's a form of poverty itself. Yes. It, without yes. Without being, having a lack. Yeah. And, mm -hmm. and to tie into that, the old, the old man, when he finally gets all that stuff, when the boys give him the gifts of hats and coats and, and shoes and all that, he ends up giving them away. Mm -hmm. which, and, she did as well. which she did as well. Yeah. And so it was a great, you know, yeah. yeah. I love that. Yeah. Well, and I feel like, um, Hannah is such a deep cut in the Bible, right? Because she is obviously the mother of Samuel. And sometimes Samuel can get be a little forgotten a little in the Bible, even though he, he's got two books named after him, right? But sometimes he can be a part of the Old Testament and the history of Israel that we kind of glaze over, right? Because everyone knows Moses, and then we get a little bit of knowledge drop off, and I'd say a good amount of people know Joshua. But the whole story of Samuel and obviously Saul, we see that in that context. Um, Hannah can kind of be like, oh, yeah, if you know Hannah, you've clearly read your Bible because, you know, not something that people necessarily know a whole lot about. So was there some some inspiration to dive into some Old Testament history um, versus, you know, we get a lot of examples of mothers in the New Testament, right? So was that some of the inspiration to go, let's let's talk about someone that we don't really know a whole lot about and we can learn together on that? Um, I think, actually, as I was just thinking of Mother's Day, my mind was just going through mm -hmm. the Bible and the different moms, yep. and uh, and maybe because I just read the Old Testament. Yeah. Uh, again, you know, I try to I try to read through the Bible every year, and, yep. and I've just kind of completed the Old Testament. Maybe that's why it was fresher in my mind. Yeah. I'm not sure, but, mm -hmm. uh, but as I was thinking about it, that's the one that popped in my mind, and I thought, oh, that would be so good for where we're at right now. Yeah. 
Yeah. Yeah. It's a big one. Um, <clears throat> I do want to kind of talk about some of your um, your main points. You went, it was funny, from week one to week two, you went from 45 verses, verse by verse, on the screen, fill in the blank, to almost no scripture on the screen. You covered a bunch of scripture, but you, I think you saw the, the task in front of you. She is, you know, you went from... First Samuel chapter one and two. So you're covering two chapters of the content. Um, was there was there a reason why you decided to go more in the direction of let's tell a story? We don't necessarily need to read through verse by verse um, with her story. Yeah, exactly. Because what you said, it was two full chapters, and yeah. I felt like it would have gotten really clunky. Yep. And then when you're also trying to explain a little bit in between, yeah, what was going on, and to come back with the points, it just felt like it made more sense to. Uh, capsulize it and then encourage people to go back and read it themselves. Yeah. 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 Um, one of the, f- not first, but yeah, one of the points that you came back to was every gift we give to God, he first gave to us, which if people listen to the sermon and have read the story of Hannah, that's very much up front, right? Right. Um, the gift that she was given um, and she was going to give to God was first given to her, which I think is an interesting story for her, right? And for all of us to remember, um, sometimes what we ask God for, he's going to ask for it back, right? Or in some context, he's going to ask that we would give that, um, which is a, a really cool story. Obviously, we see where Samuel goes. Um, but I did want to kind of talk about how hard that must have been. And we obviously see that almost carbon copy story with with Abraham and uh, Isaac, right? Yes. Um, but obviously, it was Mother's Day, so <laughs> if we're going to pick a story <laughs> yeah, to, yeah, to teach yeah. about, maybe go with the, <laughs> the Hannah story over the, um, the Abraham story. But I would like to kind of talk about, um, I am not a parent, so this doesn't necessarily hit me with the same amount of emotions and feelings that maybe you guys would have, but I would like to just kind of talk about, maybe personify Hannah a little bit, what that must have been like um, to ask God for this child and then God to say, well, yeah, I'm going to give you this child, but there's a little bit of a catch here, right? Yeah. I wonder if, I wonder if you know, all the praying she did asking for a child before she made that commitment to God, that if you do this, mm-hmm. then I will do this. Yeah. You know, that God wasn't kind of waiting for her to get to that yeah. place mm-hmm. because he really did want Samuel to yeah. be his prophet, you know? Mm-hmm. But I would say I, it's a great question to ask Allison as the mom. Mm. If your first child was Ben, you had no other children, what would that be like? Mm. Well, I was I was thinking of modern-day women and how they... Uh, some crave motherhood Mm -hmm. and they want to be able to experience pregnancy and childbirth. Mm -hmm. Um, So, because there's lots of ways you can be a parent, Mm -hmm. you know, but those that want to give birth, um, it seems a little different than what Hannah experienced. Cause I think there's this, there are things that are the same, which are like the craving to love someone. Um, God has put love in our hearts for children. Yeah. And so like it needs a place to be directed and to go. Um, I think he has also given us desire to uh, multiply and fill the earth. Mm-hmm. So like there's something in there that just feels unquenched until we do that in some way. Yeah. But I think when like she was so much extra than us because back then their, um, value as a wife, um, was dependent on their ability to be fertile and to give birth. And then also their security for the future was dependent on that. So if Hannah was a widow, her sons or daughters would take care of her in her yeah. old age. So if you were sink, if you did not have children yeah. and you became widowed, then you're like very marginalized. Yeah. So there's so much even more that was on, um, mm. on the, Table. the status yeah, yeah, yeah. of having a child. So mm-hmm. like there was, all of that. Yep. Mm-hmm. Um, I have love. I need security. I would like to have a good name in the village. Yeah. <laughs> you know, like all of that. Then yeah. when she gives that away, mm-hmm. she's saying to the Lord, 
like you're going to now need to be my security. You are going to be my good name. You yeah. are going to be the object of my love. Yeah. Like it's it's just such a shift. Yeah. I mean, mm-hmm. we can uh, identify a little bit with that in mm-hmm. modern times, but Not- I think she's just on a next tier. Yeah, I agree with you. I and I think I I think my first child was a a daughter, not a son. But when I think about her being 3 and me giving her mm-hmm. into someone else's care, I'd be thinking not only no, but yeah. No. Heck no. <laughs> yeah. 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 Yeah, no way. No mm-hmm. way I'm going to let somebody else. Right. Yeah. Um right. And and so to be able to say I'm, 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 wow! That to me, that's just such a huge, yeah, huge step of faith. Mm-hmm. I just got such great respect for her, I, and I, and I even thought about the fact that some people might think that that's a little bit cavalier. I don't mm-hmm. think so. I think it was ex- exact opposite of that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So it was, well, and I think it tells us so much about Hannah's relationship with the Lord that she would have been in that kind of um, communication with Him, where she obviously is praying to him a lot beforehand, but then makes a commitment and feels that reassurance from him that like, yes, this is the way Mm -hmm. I want you to go. Like, let's do this thing. You and me, Hannah. Yeah. And then, so she had that like assurance versus just making kind of a wild promise in the night. Like, God, I swear to you, if you give me a kid, I'll do anything, you Mm -hmm. know, like, Right. I'll even give them back to you. And then the next morning you regret it, Mm -hmm. you know? (laughs) So it seemed really intentional. It seemed that he reassured her Mm. and gave her the strength to carry that plan forward. Right. Mm -hmm. And I think, I mean, what's one of the things that surprises me is that, you know, even Jesus who knew I'm going to follow God through with the, Mm. with what he's called me to do had the time when he was saying, Hey, if you, want to take this cup from me. Is there a plan B, please? Is there? Yeah. Would you please do that? But we don't see her doing that. So she, somehow she knew and and pressed through that anyway. And I think that's what caused me, uh, originally my, kind of my theme sentence was going to be giving to God changes you. Mm -hmm. But as I reflected on that and kept reflecting on it, I thought, no, it's not just giving to God. It's giving sacrificial. Yeah. Mm that that's what makes that big change in yeah. us, you know? And, and I got to say this, um, I, I got to um, kind of crush on Allison here, Al- Allison here a second, because when we first picked this title for all of the messages, um, I thought this is a great title to give us some flexibility yeah. as to what we want to teach on for mm-hmm. the next, uh, next number of weeks. And so, yeah, that's a great deal. And then with the first message on Lazarus, um, I was having a tough time I just felt like I wasn't quite coming together. Mm. And so uh, Elsa and I were discussing that. And in the process, she just kind of said, well, what's the change for us since we're calling it changes? And as I, I began to reflect on that, it just, it's changed for me the entire series. Yeah. Because, it, and that's kind of where it focused in on this thing too is, okay, how does it change us? Wow. For Hannah, it really changed her. How should it yeah. change us? And that's when I thought, oh, it's giving sacrificially to God. Are we willing to even dare do that? And then if we do, we can be sure it's going to change us. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And in a good way. Yeah. So, well, yeah. and let's talk about that one part. We had talked about, um, so Hannah's desiring a child. Um, she promises that if she gets one, she'll devote it back to the Lord dedicate it back. Um, so then she does, she drives over to the Arbor church and she drops off the kid. <laughs> like I was picturing, this is the first time I pictured myself in Eli's position, right? Where, yeah. um, someone drives up to your church and knocks and it's like, Hey, so I've decided to devote my child to Ar- Arbor church and in your keeping now. So here's my child. And then I'd be like, Oh, <laughs> wow. Yeah, yeah. Something different. I'm now raising a child. But so then she drives away and she's singing praise to the Lord. But the way you described it is that she is going back to all outward appearances. She's going back to a life that looked much the same as before, mm-hmm. that she is childless because she gave hers away. And her um, sister wife 
is, um, right? They were sister yeah. wives yep. back then. So meanwhile, her sister wife has all the kids and it looks like she has all that outward success again. Yes. And, um, but what was changed in Hannah was uh, contentment, yes. right? Yes. Like, so outwardly, it looked the same, but inwardly, it was so different. She was different. Mm. Yeah. So yeah. I love that part. I, I hadn't really considered how it was to go back to the former um, mode of mm -hmm. how she her life looked. Um, but there was something changed inside her, which was contentment mm -hmm. or knowing, satisfaction yeah. in knowing she had done the will of right. the Lord. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. Well, I what, I, what I think is interesting, uh, Allison, you had mentioned um, the value, right, that mm -hmm. Hannah probably didn't feel because she couldn't offer what was deemed as her only value, right? Which was providing a child. Mm -hmm. And if, if we want to go back and look at that time era and one of the things that I'm constantly reminded of is even though we get to see the highlights of these people's lives, just, I mean, for some of them, we get to see the low lights, right? With Saul, we got to see quite a bit of that. Um, but with Hannah, right, we get to see this person who was obedient and listened um, but to be reminded that she was just a human and she had these motives, right? And the the value of children was to pass your name along, right? Mm -hmm. This is going to, they're going to inherit my stuff and hopefully they'll make more out of their lives and I made out of my lives and my name can have all this glory. And then the ones with really good intentions were these people will bring glory to God and they'll have my last name attached to them, right? <laughs> but to think about, if that child is going to be devoted to God and is going to be a prophet, not always, but a lot of times mm -hmm. prophets weren't going to carry that name forward. Right. So that was, that's oh. a big catch 22 of like, interesting, right. That yes. they're carrying yeah, yeah. the Lord's name forward, not their old last name. Exa yeah. Right. Like, and a lot of them, and a lot of them didn't have spouses. Exactly. So the, oh, the that's real, so yeah. interesting. Yeah. How so much not only like, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. So it is a big decision, right. Of, I will bring, I will have a child, but this child's not going to do for my husband probably what he wants, right? To carry that name forward and bring that glory back to the, the family right. name. Was she thinking she was giving um, him for profit use or for, well, didn't for God profit say I or not profit? for profit? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah, devoted to the Lord. Yeah. So devoted to the Lord would be a prophet. Yeah, he could have been, so, been a priest. Yeah, yeah. been a priest. Yeah. yeah. But okay. even priests, not even very priests, common for them right. to have children. Right. Well, I mean, Levites he, carried he, on. Right. All Eli their, did, but yeah. but but again, if he's devoted to him, yeah. then oftentimes they they wouldn't mm -hmm. end up marrying. Hmm. So that's a very very interesting yeah. point, uh, Hayden, that you bring up there. Wow, yeah. big uh, extra credit there for yeah. you. Well, yeah. Well, <laughs> also, I mean, you said extra, and I thought just a, an existential crisis for her too, of like, oh, I do want a child, but like this isn't going to accomplish the goal of why I want. Or maybe the traditional reasons of why I'd want a child, right? Right, or which, a facet of which, right, is which all, a benefit, right? Which also more props to Elkanah, yeah. her husband, yeah, who obviously uh, was in agreement with her, yeah, for making the promise, and then yeah. encouraging her to keep the promise, yeah, yeah, because it was he that was losing that mm -hmm. uh, that status, you know. Yeah. Uh, to me, one of the senses of humor I get out of it, and. Um, I thought people might laugh at it, but nobody did. And you know that does happen, right? Mm -hmm. you, 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 you think you got you think you got something kind of funny to throw you in wait, there, and yeah. your weight and everybody's going, yep, yep, yep. Well, yeah. nobody Dead. got that. Okay, move on. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. For me, it was that Elkanah, you know, and, and Hayden, you mentioned the the culture at the time, yeah. and how valuable it was. But now he's trying to let her know the culture doesn't matter to me. Yeah. You're what matters to me, mm -hmm. which was really way to go as a husband, right? Yeah. But then that he says, and and aren't I worth ten sons to you? Mm -hmm. And that she <laughs> she doesn't answer him. Yeah. You know, yeah. I mean, I could just you know she him. gave him a look yeah. like really yeah. come really? on. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> You have to ask yeah. that. Yeah, I I thought it was kind of funny that she didn't respond yeah. to his yeah. trying to help her pass that that way. But mm -hmm. yeah, nobody else thought so. <laughs> yeah, so he thought. Yeah. Well, I, I think what's so funny is clearly as as a human societal history, right? We have an issue 
commodifying things that have no business being commodities, right? A woman is a commodity because she can give children, right? And children are a commodity because they can bring notoriety, right? And sometimes we look back at the Old Testament, we kind of laugh of like, wow, how backwards was that? That I would look at a woman and her only value would be children and children's only value would be notoriety and glory for my family. But the issue is, sure, maybe we've progressed as a society and we don't look at people and, and people's lives as commodities, but we've just found new commodities that we're obsessed with. <laughs> and I think that's what's so funny about the, the Bible is you go back and look at it and we get this really cool lens to look at things that can be somewhat myopic of like, okay, these people were totally off in left field because they saw people as commodities. But now we have social media, right? Like social media in our presence has now become a commodity that we chase. And I think it's just so funny because that biblical truth, you can pull it right through, right? Of our value is in God's opinion, but it's so much easier to get other people's praise or to put more stock in it because of how we commodify the world around us. And it's like, God's like, no, I'm trying to tell you, like, I'm the only commodity that you should be chasing in life, right? And right. like, I don't want to compare God to a commodity, but that's kind of what's happening, right? Well, or we find our security yeah. in our financial yeah. planning uh, or our yeah. our career that's going to lead us, you know, to these various places and yeah. set us up for a nice retirement or mm -hmm. whatever. I yeah. mean, we, we look for security and validation yep. in all sorts of weird places. So. Well, and I, and what I think is cool about Hannah's story is it's, it's take the, the nouns out of it. And that's every human struggle, right? Mm -hmm. The opinion and the value, because clearly she had some form of relationship and devotion to God. But the thing that kept taking her down a peg was her sister wife saying, you have no value. You have no value. Let me remind you of the value you don't have. And clearly she has a relationship with God if she's willing to devote her son mm -hmm. to God, but she can't get past that hurdle in front of her, right? God's saying like, no, like you matter to me. You have value, but I got to get through to you. So I'll give you this child. The child's going to be mine just so that you can see like this is your value, that you are a child of mine. And that I love you. And it's just so funny because we look at Hannah and that's all of us, right? The mm -hmm. the opinions of other people val are valued so much higher than God's but it, opinion. I think it is even more than that, though. I mean, I think recently I've discovered how um, people's criticism, mm -hmm. like it's not that they're saying like, Allison, you're great. And yeah. like they're puffing me yeah. up and I'm getting elevated. It's more yeah. like there's criticism that hurts more than yes. I think people realize. And even though like I, Jesus and I are yep. great and he tells me all the time that he loves me mm -hmm. and that I'm close to him, but even still people can be cruel yeah. and hundred percent and it hurts more yes. than even if you're close mm -hmm. to the Lord, that still hurts. Yeah. So Penina, or is that how you say your name? Yeah, that or Penina. Oh, Penina. Um, so like, I mean, it still mattered, even though Hannah and the Lord were tight. Yeah. Um, it still impacted her yes. when she was met with unkindness. Yeah. Yeah. So. Yeah, well, that's why. Yeah. That's why we. Yeah. That's why one of the. I said, God's opinion is what matters, mm -hmm. not people's, and we, we do tend to. It's very difficult yeah. not to, take people's opinion and and uh, put that almost in front of God's. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. Well, and what I think this podcast, one of the purposes we've talked about in, in here is really drilling down on those main points because we put up Cliff's thought of, uh, let me read it verbatim, keep our mind on God's opinion, not others. Mm -hmm. You scratch that down, you write it down, you read it, that's awesome. But actually living that out is extremely difficult. Talk yeah. to... <laughs> Talk to an old wise man who's 90 years old getting ready to meet the Lord. It's still going to bother him hearing negative opinions about him from other people, right? Mm -hmm. Even though he's reminded God's opinion is the only thing that matters. And I think that's one of the things we want to get into on the podcast is, mm -hmm. Cliff, how can I actually do that? Because I know that's true. Right, right. But how often do I hear someone and I go, no, they're kind of right. 
I don't really think about what I say all the time, and sometimes I'm a little flippant. Like, <laughs> but God's never said that about me. That's just right. a truth that I believe because of my own insecurities, not because right. that's what God said. Right. And I think that's what we're kind of having a discourse on right now. Yes. Of of that was Hannah's story. That's our story. Yeah. That's everyone's story. Of how do I live out these biblical truths? When we've been proven time and time again, we are fleshly beings who oftentimes fall into our downfall as being humans, right? Yeah. Failing so, to recognize God. Yeah. So I think the answer is to learn to, a, a question to ask ourselves mm-hmm. in those situations and circumstances. Yeah. And the question is the same one mm-hmm. that God asked Adam and Eve in the garden. Yep. The question is, who told you that? Yeah. Yep. So that... uh if in the case of Hannah, if she would ask that question uh, when she is being belittled, mm-hmm. and uh, and and the assumption that God must be punishing you or doesn't like you, yeah. If she has said, "Who's telling me this? Mm-hmm. Who's telling me this?" And I think so often with those other things, and like you mentioned, uh, as I think right now mm-hmm. in our culture, with what we've just come through as mm-hmm. a as a, a country and everything else, pastors have gotten their tails kicked. And, uh, and the reason they have is because <laughs> whatever side they line up on, it yeah. doesn't matter. Somebody else is upset at them. Mm-hmm. And the two ends have been so polarized yeah. that they have been caught in the middle and had the tar beat out of them. And if they don't learn to keep coming back and going, who's telling me this? Oh, it's someone who happens to be consumed with this idea or yeah. that idea. Or maybe it's even the enemy speaking through. Mm-hmm. It's not God. Mm-hmm. And if you can't come back to that, you will absolutely find yourself like yeah. Hannah did for a period of time, mm-hmm. miserable, mm-hmm. in tears, hardly yeah. being able to eat, which is why such a high percentage of pastors today are saying if they could find something else, they'd get out. Yeah. Because they just feel so beat up by that. Mm-hmm. They're forgetting to, to really be centered by saying, yeah. who's telling me this? Mm-hmm. That's not what God tells me about who I yeah. am. Yeah. And I, and I think. Um, I it's think up to forty percent now. I heard that. 40%. Yeah, I heard that. Forty percent of pastors now wow. want to quit, leave ministry, yeah. not just leave their own job or find yeah. a different role in the church. They want to leave ministry. Ministry. Yeah, that's terrible. Yeah, it is terrible. Yeah. And and you know I can give. I'm a little side Eddie here, but I, <laughs> I, I I can suggest that maybe maybe a percentage of that forty. I'm not sure they were ever called to be in that place to begin with, <laughs> yeah. and so that would not be a necessarily mm-hmm. a bad thing. Mm-hmm. But with that high a percentage, I there's got to be a bunch that are just very wounded, and very hurt. They they said that. Sorry, this another side. Yeah. <laughs> so they say that um, so many churches are filled with um, empty pulpits now mm-hmm. because the person who decided to stay is brokenhearted mm-hmm. because they haven't quit like all the others want to, but they're just needing more encouragement than you would mm-hmm. right. believe. Right. Yeah. And so they begin to teach without without what they need behind that. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Anyhow, that Empty was suits. side yeah. angle there. Yeah. And I didn't I didn't want to uh come sure. across like I was demeaning Hannah, right? Because she was fulfilling the commandment that God gave in the garden, right? Be fruitful, multiply. And like that is part of what God had asked her to do. Um I just think one of the things that I guess pointing out in Hannah is just pointing out all of our struggles, right? Because God gave us a job to do and mainly because I don't think he wanted us to sit around and run a fan club for him all day. Like he wanted, there was jobs that needed to get done and this was for the betterment of society. He already put on mandate. Like I want you guys to start the culture here on earth. The culture is love me and do your job and she's sitting there like, well, I love you, Lord, but I can't do the job that you gave me, right? Right. And I think the cool thing that you can pull away from Hannah is like a failure to do a job or an inability to do the job doesn't reduce your value, right? God never said, Adam, your your amount of love that you'll receive from me is based off of the crops that you pull out of this garden, right? Uh-huh. You pull out a whole bushel, I'm loving you a lot. You don't pull any out, I'm not loving you. It's like, no. I love you regardless of what you do, but here's the job that I'd like you to do, right? Mm-hmm. Go out and set the culture for this earth to follow. And that's what Hannah was doing and and obviously saw um, a little bit of self-value mm-hmm. 
diminishing because she couldn't complete the job that God set in front of her, right? So I don't want it to come across like I'm saying, wow, Hannah, you're way off base because you're, you know, struggling to really see God. It's just that's what we all struggle with, right? And that's the challenge. And I think the struggle that we have to take away from your message on um, Sunday, Cliff, is how do we really just lock in on that and not be shut off to people's criticisms? Because I think that's the other healthy thing is you should be able to hear people's opinions of you and and go through a rubric of, is this valid? Can I validate this criticism? Am I off base? But realize that your value to God is not going to change regardless of people's criticisms, right? Right. So, And I think that, you know, uh, going back to our original question, yeah, what that question does when you say, who told you that, yeah, uh, is it gets the focus back to where the focus needs to mm-hmm. be, right? And, yeah. and uh, the last point we made in her story is how, how incredibly she kept her focus on the giver, yep. not the gifts. Yeah. Uh, the bless or not the blessings we said. Mm-hmm. And, um, and I think it's in our culture, it's so easy for yep. us to get focused on the blessings yep. and forget about the blesser. And, and without mm-hmm. that, then we, we run sideways. And I yep. think a lot of our, uh, even the, the 40% that Allison was talking about of pastors that are in that role, is there any, is there any precedent for that? Mm-hmm. Certainly. Yeah. Look at the prophets. Yeah. And you look at Ezekiel, and you look at Jeremiah, and you look at Isaiah, who had very little success in people listening to their message mm-hmm. and responding appropriately to it. Mm-hmm. They had to keep looking at the one who was giving yeah. them the message, mm-hmm. or they would have gone sideways themselves. What did Jeremiah say? He didn't want to do it anymore. Mm-hmm. I keep weeping about all this stuff. I don't want to keep doing it. Yeah. But I. But my bones are going to ache on me. If I don't, I can't not do it. <laughs> yeah. And I think that's all comes back to where is that focus? Is it the giver yeah. or is it this other stuff, people's opinions yeah. or the blessings or the gifts or whatever it is? So, mm. yeah. Okay. So go ahead. Oh, sorry. I was going to throw out just a random Hannah thought. Yeah. Since we're talking about her <laughs> and I was going to, I was going to walk us backward for a mm. minute about Samuel's purpose. His, yeah. One of his um, purposes was to be there at the time of um, choosing David. Yeah. And so he had to be at a certain point of his ministry where he could choose David and take place in the Saul yeah. story, etc. So then you dial it back to his birth, mm-hmm. timed so well yeah. in order to be present at that place in ministry for the David part. Mm -hmm. I think God put a desire, an extra desire in Hannah's heart for a baby and that he um, closed her womb for a certain time. That's how they used to say it is Mm -hmm. closed her womb and then opened her womb. Mm -hmm. And for her to have experienced kind of a dry spell where she craved wanting to give that baby over, it was to work out the plan that God had for Samuel's life Mm -hmm. to be born at that particular time, to be in a place in ministry, to serve um, David and all all of that scene so well. Mm -hmm. And had she been fertile before and not craved a baby and not dedicated one to him, I don't know if that purpose for Samuel's life would have ever been enacted. Right. So anyhow, her what I'm saying is her waiting had a purpose, and the time of God's answering um, had a purpose, and it encourages me because I think if I'm craving something and praying for something and not seeing it come to pass, I can trust that God has a plan for that answer um, that probably is far beyond something I could. Right, right. And even though imagine. Samuel was considered by the... Uh, Israeli nation uh, as being, uh, or all the people, as being a prophet, they also saw him. By the time Saul came yeah. around, they saw him as being the vessel that God's using to direct them and guide them. So yeah. he was kind of the de facto judge at that yeah. point yeah. Until, uh, until God appointed Saul and then David thereafter. So uh would be interesting to know to get the retrospect at that point from Hannah, huh? Yeah. Because mm-hmm. I would imagine... 
uh, unless she passed early, she probably would have been alive to see Mm -hmm. at least that part of that Mm -hmm. and to be, uh, wow, look at what happened to the child that I gave to God. Right. Maybe Mm. to have an aha moment. Like, oh, I see how it all worked together. Yeah. 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 So, So, and also to tie up some loose ends because we're getting close on time, uh, Samuel did have children. Yes. Yeah. Yes. He had yeah. children. Not those rebellious ones, right? Yeah. They were rebellious. Yes, they were. He didn't have were. any. Yes, they were. Yeah. Eli had rebellious ones. Eli had rebellious ones who Samuel. were more rebellious. Oh, but Samuel. terrible. In fact, the reason they said they wanted a king was because they didn't want Samuel's kids yep. ruling over them in the event something happened to him. Yep. Samuel and yeah. Eli both had, as the Bible describes, wayward children. Yeah. So, you know, it just goes to show you those yeah. PKs, man. Those yeah. PKs, yeah. they don't turn yeah. out great. Well, you know, and he wasn't Jesus, so we can't expect perfection <laughs> from every character in the Bible. He was a pretty good guy, yeah. just not a great parent, maybe. Yep. Yeah. So. Yep. yep. Okay. Good. Thank All you. All right. Man. Well, I think this was a great discussion. It was a lot of fun. Um, thank you guys so much for listening or watching the follow-up podcast, and we'll see you guys next week. 